likes that. Uh, we all like to win. And thanking God, you know, over over a time in December and looking back over 2023 and looking forward to 2024, I'm asking God, God, man, I don't want to just do this, this feel-good sermon series about resolutions and starting a new year and all that. And I'm saying, God, help me. Help me, God. Show me in your word. Show me what you want me to do. Show me how I can... You know, when we come to the planning our, our sermon series, we want to honor God, preach his word, and there's a third thing. We want to help you guys succeed and win. And the people online that are watching in, I want to welcome you. And, and we want you to succeed and we want you to win. That's, that's what our thought path process is. God, what do you want? Because you know these people better than I do. What does this community need? And God, how can we help? How can we serve them? How can we be obedient to you? Because he loves you. He cares about you. I, uh, I came up with this idea. And this idea was, man, I don't want the same old, same old. And I want 2024 to be different. I mean, it's burning in my heart that 2024 would be different. Now, I don't want a pandemic. I don't want that type of different, right? Anybody else with me? We don't need that type of different again. That was real different. We don't want to be confined to our homes. But I want to go to a whole nother level with God. And I want to go to a whole nother level in, in my service to him and in my pack, impact to my family and my community. And so I looked at 1 Corinthians 2.19, 2, 2 9. That's in your worship program. If you don't have a worship program, you raise your hand and David will get you one. I guarantee you he'll take care of you, okay? If you don't have a worship program, you'll get one. But 1 Corinthians 2 9 in your worship program says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. And I'm thinking about this passage. I'm, I'm praying over it. God, you say, I can't even fathom, I can't even conceive it, I can't even understand what you have for me. I say, Lord, would, you, would, would that be true in 2020? Would you do so much more in 2024 than what I could conceive, what I could even think of, what I, I could even imagine? If I were to write the story of 2024 right now, then I couldn't even do it justice what you do in 2024. And as, as I've been researching and praying and seeking God and, and reading the word and reading and researching, this, this thing of, of when the day, when the day came, came to the heart and mind and it came before me. And what is when the day? Here's, how many of you know that momentum is a big thing? Momentum is huge. See, I was an offensive lineman and I played left guard. And one of the things that a left guard gets to do, he gets to pull a lot. I pull to my left with the sweep. And I pull to my right with the trap. And I loved it. You know why I loved it, Billy? Because these big old 300 plus pounders didn't know I was coming. And I get out of my stance and I turn and I go down the line and I got as much momentum as I possibly can. I put my head into that problem called a defensive lineman, and I drive him as far as I can to the dirt. And my uh, my running back, his name was Leroy Kennard, who has just became the head football coach at Innovation High School in Lake Norman. Come on. Come on. That's pretty cool. He would, he would, he would see old Big Barry Rice is what he would call me. Let's go, Big Barry Rice. I say, oh, you talk. He see me kicking out, and right inside of me, he would cut right up the field. 
we, we made a lot of yards that way. But momentum is a huge thing. And here's what I mean by momentum. If I will just focus on winning today, if I will just not be distracted by the past, if I will just focus on winning today, not to, to be a dreamer and just sit there and dream about tomorrow, but if I would just win the day, get it done today. I could do anything for one day if I would win the day. Tomorrow, if I would just win the day, win the day the next day. If I would just win the day, guess what happened? starts to compound and all I focused on was winning the day see with our resolutions we get overwhelmed because our resolutions are for a whole year 74% of all resolutions are quit by the end of January so we're doing this series called win the day and we started it last week do you remember the title of last week's sermon some of you may have the, the insert in your Bible, but was anybody remember? All right, you can cheat. Yeah, flip the script. What's up? What does that mean? It means to change my story. And last week, we, I mean, we looked at Joseph's life. If anybody had a story that was really not very good, it was Joseph. And if you'll download the app, go to your app store and go, go church. Orlando and download the app. It's there. You can listen to it. Last week's sermon. Today's sermon will be up there probably tomorrow. But it's it's live right now and it's on Facebook now. But anyway, y'all are watching it, right? So jo Joseph was betrayed by his family. Betrayed. Thrown into slavery. They were going to kill him. But they said, no, nah, he's not, he's worth more to us. If we sell it, at least we get some money in our pockets. And why did they hate him? They hated him because dad looked at Joseph and, and he was his favorite, favorite son. Gave him a coat of many colors, right? And they said, this is what they did. They took that coat of many colors that they hated him for and they ripped it to pieces and they dipped it into goat's blood. And said, look, Daddy, this is what's happened to your boy. Do you recognize it? That's the type of background that, that Joseph had. I mean, some of you can relate. And then he, he gets sold into slavery, and he won the day of being faithful. He won the day of being faithful. He was faithful. He was faithful. He was obedient. And, and God just promoted him and promoted him. And God gave him the gift of interpreting dreams and, and guess what? Because of the favor and because he had good looks, Potiphar's wife wanted him. And because she couldn't have it, she lied. She lied and had this man thrown in jail. He was doing right, and he said to her, how in the world can I sin against God and sin against my master? And you know what she did? If I can't have them, nobody will. Pray. She cried wolf, man, and got him thrown into, and, and her husband no longer trusted him. No lie. There was a dream by the, uh, by the leader that, that, uh, that was haunting him. And nobody could, you know, the king, and the, the uh, Caesar, no one could could interpret the dream. And so the cupcake man, the baker, and the the cup holder for the king said, Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, we you know, we know a guy. He's in prison now. Joseph, he's a guy that interprets dreams. And so they went to Joseph and and, and Joseph interpreted the dream. And it was like these dead cows and these stalks of grain and, and seven, eight, seven. And he interpreted and said that God's, it is God's job to interpret dreams because he's a giver of dreams. And basically what happened with Joseph, he told them that there's going to be seven years of drought and preceded by seven years of abundance. 
So he built these huge barns and filled them with a grain of abundance. And every nation came to them to buy that grain in the seven years of drought. And so many lives were saved. It was during that time that Joseph's brothers were sent to Egypt to get grain by their father. And who did they have to go see? Joseph. And Joseph said this, once they recognized who he was, in G Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done and save and the saving of many lives. He flipped the script. He changed the story. He didn't just say, well, man, I'll never be anything. Not even my family believe in me. David could say that too, right? He could say, man, I tried to do right, God, but look, what, look where it got me. It got me in prison. You know, even, even the, the leaders, Potiphar's wife, lied about me. I mean, he could say, you know, really have a big pity party, but he didn't. He flipped the script and he changed his, he turned his back on his past and said, this is not going to be my story because God has a better story for me. Some of you in this room, you need to believe the sermon from last week and say, God has a better story for me. And flip the script and change your story. Some of you in this room, you have dreams. You, you have this thing that wells up inside of you that was given by God. But Satan has taken it away from you. Satan has lied to you and said, no, you can't do that. You can't do this. Look at you. Look at you. And so we come to the day, and the flip the script was about burying your past. Burying your past. Not allowing it to harass you and to hijack your future. And this second sermon in this series is about the same thing. It's a, <laughs> notice this story. I mean, this, this title of today's sermon, Kiss the Wave. Not this type of wave, but this type of wave. A, a sea wave, a wave that if you stand on the edge of the bank of the sea or the ocean, and you just let these waves hit you, eventually it's going to take you down. It's going to drown you. I mean, the flag is on warning. And these big old waves. And you know what? The people who ride the waves, they're looking for the flag of warning. Because they are wanting to catch the wave and kiss it. Pastor Barry, what, what do you mean by kiss the wave? Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay, I don't hear the pages turn, so turn on your phone. And then and then give me a good mm-hmm when you get there. Mm-hmm. 1 Peter chapter 1. Mm-hmm. Verse 6. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, I want you to turn to someone and say, a little while. A little while. It didn't come to stay. But now you greatly rejoice because of it was just a little while. You had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Uh, there was this great preacher, E.V. Hill. Look him up, Coach Biggs. He's a great preacher from, from California. He's no longer alive, but he was a great preacher. And he was an amazing architect of words. And he said, my favorite verse in all the Bible says this. He would, he would have this incredible voice, this incredible accent, and just smooth as silk. He said, my favorite verse in all the Bible is that it came to pass. He said, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Let your past be in the past. And it says this, in all of this, you greatly rejoice, though for a little while, you should circle that in your Bible or highlight it in your phone. You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They have come. 
these trials, this suffering, so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. God never wastes pain when it comes to his saints and his servants. God doesn't waste pain. Another, another preacher said that in the good times and our comfort, God whispers. But in our pain, he yells. See, sometimes we've got to understand that the greatest teacher is sometimes our problems, our struggles, our insecurities, our depression, and our triumphs, and sometimes even our temptations. That God is always working. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about Charles Hatton Spurgeon. Charles Hatton Spurgeon said this, when the gold knows why and where for, wherefore, it is in the fire. When the gold knows why and wherefore it is in the fire, it will, it will thank the refiner for putting it in the crucible. And will find a sweet satisfaction in the flames. What I recently did not know about Spurgeon is that he had a disease called Bright's disease, which was a, a kidney dysfunction that was really a problem. He had rheumatoid arthritis, and he became the pastor of the largest church in Europe, the Metropolitan tabernacle when he was 22 years old he's 22 years old and he's preaching a sermon and someone comes in and says there's a fire there's a fire there's a fire and everybody floods out of the huge arena that he's in and seven people were killed i think there was a fire in the street or a building was on fire down the road and that haunted him. His, his health issues and the way of being a pastor and, and of the largest church in Europe and, and the way of those people dying while he was preaching, he went into an incredible depression. In all of his life, he couldn't shake it. He, he, he said it was like a... A, um, a thorn in my flesh that he dealt with depression and people didn't understand it because when he would relate to people he was so chipper and jolly and when he would preach he was so powerful but when he was alone and, and in between Sundays Satan would just beat on him and beat on him and beat on him and he would struggle with depression Sickness is not sin. To give in, to be overcome by, to be defined by, to get your identity by your sickness is. When God says you have a different identity. My wife, you can ask her. I didn't ask permission, Crystal, to talk about this. I should have. But when I took the biggest job of my life, I took the job of being a youth pastor at a ch one of the largest churches in America. And within a couple weeks of taking the job, my wife was bound to a bit. For one year and a half, she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. We all have incredible burdens to bear. But you bearing your burdens, you cannot be identified 
with a very religious prayer. And understand, it's, it's a visitor that will not be there forever. And that it's, it's an instrument of God to teach us. So, when Charles Hatton Spurgeon was asked, after the fact that people understanding his health issues and his incredible bout with depression, they asked him, how did you do it? How do you do it? How do you maintain such incredible teaching and, and maintain your leadership and maintain such a, in the pulpit, such a jolly, incredible personality? You know what his answer was, John? His answer was this. I kiss the wave that pushes me or throws me against the rock of ages. I didn't understand that at first. But I'm hoping and praying that as I finish this sermon, that you'll walk away from here inquisitive, but also understanding that the wave is your obstacle. It's whatever you're suffering with. It's whatever you're struggling with. It's whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a wave. And you can either be swept away by it and destroyed by it, or you can soar over it. You can ride it and kiss it. And, and he says, the one that throws me against the rock of ages, what he was seeing with that, who's the rock of ages? There's no other firm down, there is no firm foundation, no man can set other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock of ages. And what he's seeing is that the struggle, the obstacle, throws me into dependence upon Jesus himself. And whatever that throws us into dependence and, and a closeness and, and, and a, a uh, intimacy with Jesus, we need to kiss it. We need to see it as a blessing. And we need to embrace it. Amen. See, you can't go on and be released from 2023 and, and every year in your past until you kiss that wave. And you flip the script. You cannot move on. I want to talk about Peter and David. David was a shepherd boy. Grew up tending the sheep. He was the youngest, just like Joseph. And, and he defeated a lion. He defeated a bear. And he defeated a giant. And he experienced some incredible things in his life, but he experienced incredible failures. And if you hear me say anything today, listen to this, especially if you're under 50. I used to think, and I used to have a huge fear of failure. I used to Oh, I just don't want to be identified with that. I had to win everything. And if I didn't win everything, I felt like of no value. Can I tell you this, young people? That if you never fail, you are not trying. You are not pushing towards greatness because it's in the failures that you grow. The key is don't quit. Keep showing up. Do not quit and understand it's just a failure. Try it again. Failures do not define you, and they're not the worst thing. The worst thing in life is never trying to do anything great. That's worse. If you try to do something great, you will fail. And David failed. He murdered a man. 
that was married to the woman he lusted after and had an affair with and, and, and pushed her to an affair. This is the greatest king, one of the greatest kings of Israel. I mean, his affair is right here. And people have been reading it for several thousand years. Everybody knows his business. And David says this in Psalm 23. Everybody knows this, right? The 23rd Psalm. David says, the Lord is my what? He's my shepherd. He put two and two together. As he was a, a shepherd of sheep, he led like a shepherd. David was like a shepherd boy. He, he was a shepherd leader. And now he says in the 23rd Psalm that God is my shepherd. He says, I'm a little mad. I'm a sheep. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And can't nobody talk about sheep like David because he was a shepherd. He guides me along. This is what God does. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because David's sheep didn't have to fear the wolves. Because David would lay down his life getting between the wolves and his sheep. Come on. With his staff. Come on, wolf. And he knew that God would get between everybody that would point their fingers at that. David, you can't be king. Look what you did. Everybody that would ridicule him and every evil enemy. That they had to go through God to get to him. And if they got to him, it was God's plan and God's way. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I hear this story. I hear the story that when, when the, the little ewes, the, the, the little sheep, Wander away. Do you know what you do, Matthew? Matthew, you know what that shepherd would do? You, you don't know. I guarantee you, you don't know. If the if the little sheep would wander away, Matthew, the shepherd loved the sheep, and he, and he knew that if he wandered away, the wolf was out there to get him, or, or sheep would get stuck in a hole. Sheep, if their head got below their feet, they couldn't get up. And that's why sheep, he didn't want the sheep to wander away. He couldn't protect them from the wolves. So he couldn't protect them from the element. He couldn't, they couldn't get to, uh, they wouldn't drink water that was running. You know, like a, like a stream. Sheep won't, they're too scared to drink it. They're, they're dying of thirst standing beside a creek. They're scared. But if a shepherd shows them the water and draws us the water, they'll drink it. You know what a shepherd has to do to a wandering sheep and parents? You have to do this sometimes. And brothers and sisters, God has to do this to us sometimes. You know what he does? He breaks the lamb's leg. Wandering sheep get their legs broken by the good shepherd. Why? Is that punishment? You know what? It, it, it seems like it. It would seem like punishment. I mean, inflicted pain, is, is, it, is that the heart of God? Well, hey, hey, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to break your leg. I guarantee you my mom probably said that. <laughs> no. You know why? Man, this really spoke to me. You know why the shepherd breaks his leg? Because from then on, Lord, the shepherd carries the baby lamb on his shoulders. You remember the incredible picture of Jesus carrying lambs on his shoulders? Well, every, every shepherd knows what that is. That lamb had a broken leg. And the intimacy of that lamb being toted on the shoulders of the Savior. The shepherd. You know what that, that little lamb learns to do? 
He learns the smell of the shepherd. He learns to trust the shepherd and he hears the Kieran voice and he feels the rub of the shepherd as his shepherd is carrying this, this lamb. And this lamb grows up to be one of the best lambs in all of the flock because it trusts the shepherd now. It is so overwhelmed by the love and the care of the shepherd. Oh, you better not talk bad about my shepherd. That little, I don't have, I don't have sharp teeth, but that lamb will bite you if you talk about his shepherd. Do you see the illustration, gentlemen? Do you see that God loves us enough? His heart is not vengeful or wrathful towards his children. That he, he wants bad things to happen to him. No! People in the world don't understand God's heart when they think that way. That is not God. That is the enemy lying to them. God's heart is that he wants what's best for you. And he's tender. He's caring. And he cares more about your success in becoming who he planned for you to be. He loves you. And he loves you enough to hurt himself by breaking your leg. That's kissing the way, my friends. Notice the heart of David when he realized he let the shepherd down. It's recorded in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to my memory of your unfailing love, according to the remem the remembrance of your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You have showed me, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. He had a child that he became the father of because of that sin, that he had to see every day and love every day, but a reminder of his sin. Against you, O oh God, and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was born a sinner. I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother could see me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb, and you taught me wisdom in the secret place. He's saying, I knew better. I knew better. I know your heart. And why in the world would I have done this? Oh, God, cleanse me. With what? With hyssop. You know what hyssop is? It's the same bush that your grandmother used to spank you. It's a switch bush. It was a spanking bush. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed. Oh, how can David say that? Huh? Come on, the lamb? David's walking with a limp because he said, I've sinned and you've broken my leg. You've crushed the bones inside of me. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew me a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore my joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way. I will serve you so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would have brought it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, oh God, is my brokenness. My sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Look at me, people. 
Look at me, brothers and sisters. Listen. Come before the Lord broken. Don't come before the Lord acting like you're sufficient. Acting like, oh, we're good. What's up, my homie? Come before God broken. I need you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. Bring your brokenness to God. Bring your divorce to God. Bring your, your struggles to God. Bring your lack of, of success to God. And allow it to, to throw you against the rock of ages. David realizes God's love in discipline and brokenness. Jesus said, we all know John 10, 10, right? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you may have life. What is the backdrop of that? Jesus says these words in 10. Before 10, he says, and then 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the, the wolf come and he abandons the sheep and runs away, and then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters him. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. He says, I ain't like that. I ain't gonna leave you nor forsake you. I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Can I tell you the next passage I'm going to share with you is hard? Can you receive it? Can you receive it in the love that I want to share with you? And that this is not me accusing, but me showing the word of God. And I want the Holy Spirit to show you what God wants you to see today. The incredible book to the people of God in Hebrews chapter 12. In your struggle, he's saying stop whining. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses your son, his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't make light of it. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because of this one thing is true, and you can know. Verse 6, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. If you're not being disciplined by God, you may not know him. You may not be his child, and you may not be in a relationship with him. But when you are disciplined and rebuked by a holy God, know this one thing. That is an expression of love towards you from your father. He loves you enough to break your leg. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Uh-oh. Verse 7, he tells us to endure hardship as discipline. That is not my words. That I am not being Job's friends and saying the reason why you're going through this, you said, now curse God and die. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is what the word of God, that when we go through hardship, we need to take it as a son and as a daughter of God and say, God, what do you want me to know and grow and understand? How do you are wanting to use this to change me and make me into what you want me to be? Endure hardship as this discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? The ones that are not loved. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, 
then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good. In order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest. Of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Accept it. Accept it. Accept hardship, temptations, as disciplines. James put it this way. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know, because we know, that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And perseverance finishes its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Character. Character. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, is the wave. Blown and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from God. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. If you don't look at the wave, the obstacle, as a blessing from God, you're going to be tossed to and fro, and you're going to be thrown to the end of the earth. You're going to be, you're going to really be a failure. So count it all joy. What about Job? I got about 10 more minutes in this sermon. I hope that you'll stick with me. I'm sorry I'm going over, but I got a lot to say. Job got the news that all of his kids were dead in a rubble, in a, a structure collapsing, and every one of his kids died. And they come and tell Job, and verse 20 of Job 1 says this, at this, Job tore his robe. He took his clothes and uh, ripped them. And then he shaved his head. You know why he did that? Because he didn't want to fake it. He didn't want to pretend everything was all right. So he just shaved his head. He tore his clothes. And then he fell, fell to the ground, David. He fell to the ground in worship. Come on, man. He fell on his face and he started worshiping God. I can remember a time I was hurting so bad I was driving a dump truck on Route 29 in Virginia. And I was hurting so bad I was just crying like a baby. I've been really hurt and I just started singing. Jesus Jesus, something about that name, Master, Savior, something about that name. I just started singing the name of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, for a spell in my life, that's the only way I survived that time. And Job fell on his face in worship and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised in all. All this in our God. Some of you in this room, you are sinning. Because you say God doesn't love me. Look what he, if God really loved me, he would do this for me. You're telling me that the God of the universe has to jump through our hoops to prove that he loves us? No, he doesn't. He gave his son. What more does he need to do to prove to us that he loves us? He cares way more about the end product of who you're going to be in your character, in your situation, and, and who you're going to meet in your problem, in your struggle, and in your trouble than to release you. Do not say that God is unjust. Do not say that God is wrongdoing when he allows bad things to happen to people. Because it's only through... 
The refining of all that God wants us to do. His wife was one of those people. Don't be that wife. Don't be that husband. Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 9. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? You know what she said to him then? Are you still going to be a man of God? Are you still going to be a worshiper? She tells him, curse God and die. And he replied, you're talking like a crazy woman, a foolish woman. Shall we accept the good from God, the salvation, and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Some of us don't trust God. Because we blame him instead of allowing him to teach us. When we go through the, our ordeals. Peter, Job, David, Joseph. The stories of the Bible tells us that this fact is true. That God does not abandon his children. The situations to make them better. You know Peter? Peter was the one that was the leader of the disciples. And Jesus just got word that Peter, excuse me, Jesus just got word that his, his cousin was beheaded. And Jesus told the people, I need some time. So he went up on a mountain and he prayed all night, all night. And the disciples were out on the boat and, and there was a storm and they were going crazy and whining. And Jesus is, is going to just go and walk on the water. And they see him and they think it's a ghost. And they go, ah! <laughs> They're fearful. And then Peter hears, hey, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out and walk on the water too. And Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. As long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, there is nothing. Hear me. Hear me, Peter tells us this, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, there is nothing that can drown you. If you kiss the wave, there's nothing that can drown you. I want to tell you, this is some good preaching. So he gets out and he's walking on the wave and then he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he looks at the wave. He looks at the, the storm in his life. If you take your eyes and you're focused on the storm, storm, you're focused on your pain, and you're not focused on, on God, you will sink into deep depression. We get depressed when we keep our eyes off of God and we look at our circumstances. But when we keep our eyes on God, we, we ride the wave when we kiss him. Of, of, of the... Uh, disciples, Jesus arrested and he follows him at a fall off and he's around the fire and this little girl like Kimmy, my, my, my 10 year old sir mister, weren't you with that Nazarene guy that everybody's talking about and it says this in Matthew 16, jump, jump the passage to Matthew 16 Peter excuse me It's Matthew 26. Now Peter was sitting in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus in Galilee, she said, and he denied him. Peter denied him. And he denied him again. And he denied him again. And what happened? The rooster crowed three times. Do you know what happened? When the rooster crowed three times, that would be a reminder for the rest of his life that every time a rooster crowed, I denied the Lord. It was like Satan wanted to identify him as a denier. And remember, the Lord had to tell Peter, get behind me. That passage is in your notes. Get behind me, you Satan. He called Peter Satan because he didn't have the things of God in his mind. When, when Peter said, no, you're not going to die. I'll, I'll give my life for you. And he who was willing to stand up and say, no, I'll give my life for you, denied him in front of a little girl. What could that girl do to him? 
And then in John chapter 21, Peter says, I'm going fishing. <laughs> I'm going fishing. And Simon Peter told his disciples he had enough. And they said, well, we'll go with you. They'll leave him. So they went out and got in the boat, but the night they caught nothing. Every early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side and you'll find some. And they, they're asking, so let me see your fishing license. When they did, they were unable to hold the net in because of the large number of fish. If you really want to fish, I'll let you fish, man, Jesus says. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 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 you know who that is? It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say this, it is the Lord. He, he threw out his clothes. He wrapped his clothes around him, and he, he jumped into the water. Now look at verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, who he was in the past, his name, son of John, the past, do you love me? Well, feed my, my baby sheep, feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, John do you love me more than these? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, why in the heck are you fishing? I called you to something different. I called you to be a fisher of men. Feed my sheep. What are you doing? Are you working a job that you're not supposed to be working? Are you doing something you're not supposed to be doing because God has a calling over your life, but because you're sick or because you've gone through a divorce or you've gone through tragedy, you're saying, I'm disconnected. I'm disqualified. That is absolutely no. God's not finished with you. God has a plan for your life, and he is not done until you're done. Amen. So much more to say. Let me tell you how you can kiss the way. And you cannot dance around these. You cannot, you cannot make a shortcut. You must, first of all, take responsibility for your failures. There's no other way. I messed up. Stop blaming others. Don't be a victim. Say, I did it, and God had a plan in it, and he still has a plan in it. Number two, forgive those who have hurt you. And have you. Forgive them. Forgiveness is not saying that they didn't do it. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay. Forgiveness means because God forgave me, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm no longer going to allow you to be in my dreams. I'm no longer going to allow you and what you did to hurt me and abuse me, to haunt me and to poison me. I'm no longer going to hold it over your head. I am going to let go, and I'm going to give you uh, forgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your life toward a parent or someone in your life, I'm telling you, it's holding you back from the promised land. And it doesn't hurt them. It's, it's like taking poison and, and swallowing it and expecting someone else to die. Number three, stop thinking you're okay. Confess your sin and get right with him. And confess your need of God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Somebody needs to hear this. Number four, you need to trust God because he's trustworthy. Man will let you down. Spouses will let you down. 
Preachers will let you down. Bosses will let you down. Everybody will let you down, but God won't. I promise you, you can take it to the bank that you can trust God. He'll never let you go. And he'll never abandon you. There's only one letter from good and God. It's the realization of, oh, God is good. Trust God in making me into what he wants me to be. May this give you some context to Romans 8, 28. And we know, now you know, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Everything. Even murder that David did. Even denying God that Peter did. 